Hey, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Although it's probably still a little bit early for some of our registered participants. So fortunately, we are recording this today and we'll post it to our Vermont Credit Union's YouTube channel for everybody to share with employees and staff and everybody else. You know, um, the Association of Vermont Credit Unions and Vermont Credit Unions have had a great relationship with uh, CUNA Mutual Group for forever now, it seems like. Uh, there was a CUNA Mutual long before there were Credit Unions in Vermont. There was a CUNA Mutual, um, and our founding fathers of Credit Unions in Vermont and the Association of My Credit Unions, my Credit League at the time, were also the founding fathers of CUNA and CUNA Mutual Group. Uh, so we have a joint uh, history that we share. Um, and for all the years that I've been involved with Vermont Credit Unions, which are a few now, um, you know, CUNA Mutual has been supportive of our organization and all Vermont Credit Unions uh, from A to Z in every situation, every campaign that we've done. Uh, everything that's come up. Uh, so we're really proud to have uh, uh, a long-term, successful, mutually beneficial relationship with CUNY Mutual and Vermont Credit Unions. Um, so we're pleased to be presenting this program today uh, in concert with CUNY Mutual. As I said, we're going to be making this available to everybody else on our YouTube channel. Uh, a couple housekeeping rules, uh, just so you're aware. Um, I think when you joined, you uh, were all automatically muted. Uh, we want to encourage you to ask questions and make comments during the three sessions that we have today. Um, so feel free to do so. Just remember to unmute yourself and then when you're done to mute yourself again. Or if you prefer, you can feel free to use the chat box. I think you all know how to use that, which is on the bottom or to the right or left of your screen, whatever your arrangement is. Um, and we'll be monitoring that chat box for any questions or comments uh, anybody may be posting in there. Um, as I said, we've got three sessions at 10, 11, 15, and 1 today. We're going to be taking breaks in between each of them. Uh, you can leave your connection running if you like, um, or you can disconnect if you have the link uh, that you just used to connect today. Uh, right now, you can come back to that link again. It'll be good, and you can be admitted back in again. Uh, so without further ado, to get us going on our first session, I want to turn things over to the association's vice president, Christine Davidson. Christine? Thank you, Joe. So today we have Jeff Davenport, and he is the financial consultant for CUNA Mutual Group, and he will be talking us, to us today about industry trends and maximizing net interest income. Jeff has spent the past 32 years in the financial service industry, starting in banking in 1988 and moving to credit unions in 1996. Jeff started his career in banks, going from collections to eventually a branch manager and commercial lender. Jeff was hired by the Federal County Federal Credit Union as part of their succession planning as the VP of Lending and Marketing, eventually becoming the EVP and eventually the President CEO. In 2002, Jeff was hired by CUNA Mutual Group to be the regional sales manager in New England, leading the sales executive team, working with the credit unions in Maine, New Hampshire, Mass, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and Vermont. In 2009, Jeff was recruited by Southbridge Credit Union to become their president CEO. The credit union is a $190 million credit union in South Central Mass with over 11,000 members. Jeff started a member business lending program as well as an indirect auto lending program for the credit union and was instrumental in bringing other products and culture changes to the credit union before leaving in 2017 to return to the CUNA Mutual in his current capacity. Jeff currently serves as a financial consultant working with the sales team on CUNA Mutual in the eastern half of the United States with credit unions of all sizes. Jeff consults with the sales team as well as credit union management team on various financial strategic and marketplace issues in credit unions. Jeff has facilitated credit union strategic planning session and has spoken at various credit union events through his career and truly loves working with the credit unions and helping credit unions of all sizes remain relevant to their members and consumers. Jeff has served in various chapter office roles, as well as lead committees in the past chair of the New England Cues Council. Jeff is currently the board chair for the board of directors for North State Federal Credit Union, a $200 million credit union in Maine. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. We appreciate your time. 
Great, thank you, Christine, and good morning, everybody. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to spend a little time with you this morning talking about uh, what's happening in the industry, but hopefully taking the opportunity to pull down what's happening, the, the, the things that you hear about uh, from an economic perspective from Steve Rick and Mike Shank and what they're seeing from, a, from an economic trend and a credit union trend. I'm gonna try to bring that down today to a little bit more granular to the impact on the income statement and, and what that all means. And I know early, uh, later, Peter, Peter's gonna talk about uh, some liquidity and balance sheet type of, of uh, management, but I'm gonna spend my time talking about the income statement. So today, this is the first thing I always look at because I, I've, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer and I, I've always been a firm believer that this is a key barometer to, to what's going on and what will go on in our business. And that's consumer confidence. Because if, if consumers are not comfortable and there's a lot of uncertainty in around what their, what their economic lives are gonna look like, their financial lives, they're not out there purchasing. And if they're not out there purchasing, they're not, out, they're not borrowing, they're not using the credit cards. Because one thing that we see is when consumer confidence declines, credit card usage declines with it. So basically what you see in this type of environment, and you can see in the past at its peak, consumer confidence was up over almost 140 points. Now we're down to below 100. That's the first time we've been below 100 since 2014. So you can see how consumer confidence has grown and you could correlate this if you line this up with a chart I'm going to show you in a couple minutes, this lines right up with what you all experienced, what we all experienced from a loan growth perspective over the same period of time. So this, this is important because what's, what's happening and what you're all seeing right now, because I, I'm, I'm imagining that everybody uh, running a credit union right now has the same problem. I've got a ton of deposits coming through the door. Loan growth is slowed down. I don't know what to do with all this liquidity to get any yield. And that's happening across the country. At least the credit unions that I'm dealing with throughout the East Coast are, are challenged with the same situation right now. I've got all this liquidity, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with it based on what we're seeing from a consumer confidence because when you get, when consumer confidence is down, savings typically outpace, savings growth typically outpaces uh, borrowings and purchases as it relates to consumers. I threw this slide in here. This is something you've probably seen with Steve Rick's presentation on a couple of occasions, but a couple of things that I really wanted to highlight, uh, which kind of ties into what I just talked about. When we get to a, the, the original, the state that we're in, we see that increase in precautionary savings. That's what you're experiencing now. People fleeing to safety, putting money in the share account, maybe keeping it in the share draft account, maybe a few putting it in a money market account, trying to keep it uh, liquid, so when they need it, they can get to it. Um, more people, you know, health insurance premiums going up. I mean, at some point, from what we're seeing from a from a, a health crisis perspective, and everything that's going on in the medic in the health fields, in the hospitals, and and the cost that's going into into COVID and and mitigation of COVID, that's gonna that's gonna play out with increased cost. From a health perspective, from a health uh, insurance and health um, and medical perspective, so those things are going to come around to increase as hospitals retrench, try to get back to some sort of profitability, trying to trying to get themselves retooled, dealing with COVID now and in the future. So that's going to increase their expenses, which is going to increase the expense and the bills that we all pay when we go to the hospital and go to the doctor, which in turn is going to, is going to impact health insurance premiums, which leads to lower consumer spending because people aren't sure if they're going to keep that they've got their jobs long term. Uh, they're not sure what you know what their uh, what their health is going to be like. The increased cost of of, of medical expenses. So those things are all playing out in the minds of of a lot of consumers out there. You know, fewer people traveling for vacation. I mean, there's a lot of people who have put vacation plans on hold and the airlines are feeling that right now and the resorts and the hotels are feeling that. So this, this is all gonna trickle down to, to an overall impact to the everyday consumer. This chart, you know, you've seen probably a few times, the, the, you know, we're in a record low interest rate environment. 
um, you know, 10-year treasury. I can remember two years ago talking to uh, this group in Vermont, only we were, we were face-to-face and talking about, you know, the 10-year treasury, how the 10-year, 10-year treasury target, which we price our mortgages off, we were expecting that to be in the two to two to three percent range. Now we're talking fast forward to now. Now we're thinking, well, if we hit one percent 10 year treasury rate, we're going to be lucky in 2020. This morning was right around 77 basis points. It's bubbled up above 80 basis points a couple times over the past couple of weeks. But uh, I think it's going to be a stretch for us to see that 10 year treasury rate getting to one percent or higher by the end of the year. But you can see just what's happened to the yield curve as of September. In 2008, we saw what happened there in December. The yield curve really on the short end of the yield curve really isn't doing much, which, which again is putting pressure on your liquidity because you know, where do you put the money? If, whether you put it in a six month or one year investment or something longer in duration, the risk reward really isn't there from a rate perspective. So, so those are some of the challenges that we're all faced. And more than likely, we're going to see this low flat rate environment into 2024. Now, one thing I added, I added, I don't know if anybody follows the, the, the Chicago uh, Board Options Exchange, the volatility index, as it relates to the stock market. And as we all know, when the Fed looks at rates, they're looking at consumerism, but they're also looking at what's happening in, in, the, in the stock market on Wall Street. So I brought this up because this is one thing I always, I always look at uh, when I think about what's happening from an economic perspective in the markets. And, and I like to look at the volatility index. And the higher that volatility index goes, the more uncertainty over a 30-day period that's in the marketplace as to what really is going to happen um, from an economic perspective. So I, I pulled this in. I pulled this this morning. And I, I just added it. So you can see back, this is, these are the recessions that we had. This was 2001 uh, when we, you know, 9-11 and the tech bubble burst. You can see we peaked, um, you know, just between 40 and 45% from a volatility. Look what happened back at the Great Recession, almost 80, 80 points from a volatility perspective, which showed that there was a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace as to what was going to happen with with rates, with companies, with the stock market, there was a lot of uncertainty coming through this. And this was this was because it was a financial crisis that we were up against because of the mortgage markets and everything just imploding. And now look what happened. And you know, now we're in not in a and now we're not in a financial crisis, but we're in a health crisis. And I think the good news here, when we think about the volatility, we've actually start we've actually been seeing this play out in the stock market because the market continues to, to, to bounce. I mean, it, it'll, it'll come down two or three days in a row, then it'll bounce back. But what you see here is the volatility and the uncertainty was much lower in the minds of investors than it was back after the Great Recession. So, so this kind of leads me to feel that from a rate environment, from an economic environment, that the recovery hopefully is going to be a lot shorter coming out of this recession than it was coming out of the Great Recession back in 2009. This is what we're looking at right now. And this is something Steve Rick has talked about on several of occasions. I mean, we're looking at now your, your share growth, 18.6% is, is what we're thinking about. Okay, and this is what we're projecting. Loan growth, 6%. And that's gonna be kind of a leveled off amount uh, over the next couple of years where share growth is going to drop from 18 down to 8%. So that liquidity issue that we all had coming into through 2019 and, th and to, into the beginning of 2020, those liquidity issues now were pretty much gone. I mean, the credit union that, that, that I'm on, the board I'm on, we were hovering between, you know, from a, from a, a, a liquidity perspective, we were right on the bubble month after month against our our uh, benchmark now we're well beyond that so so that liquidity so loan to shares you know as an industry loan to share was was up eight eighty five eighty six percent last year that's going to continually start to continue to come down as loan growth slows and share growth continues so a lot of you are probably already seeing this and you're already feeling it in your margins um, 
as you as you look at more deposits coming in, increasing your cost of funds uh, in, in 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 some ways, um, loan growth slowing down, and and your, the yield on your loan portfolio and the average yield on your investment portfolio starting to come down. So we're already starting to feel that pinch um, as an industry, and that's bringing down that whole yield on assets. 404 in 2019, projecting down about 3.4 this year and down another 20 basis points by the end of next year because of what we're seeing. You know, watch, look at the look at the 10 year treasury, what that's doing. So so that's that's really from a rate perspective and what we hear from the Fed. Rates in the short term probably are not going to do too much over the next two or three years, which comes to the point of what are you know what are credit unions going to do to try to create more yield in the in their portfolios whether it's the loan portfolio or the investment portfolio you know what what are those so typically the way i look at it is there's only there's two ways you're going to drive more yield in your investment portfolio or, or your or your credit portfolio and that is take on more credit risk or take on more extension risk to drive more yield so those are the things that some of the credit unions i've talked to to was you know, what are some of the things you're considering? Uh, part of our CU, our credit union council that we have here at CUNA Mutual, we polled them back a few months ago and a couple credit unions said, we're taking a step back and we're looking at our lending strategy, our loan, our loan policies to create more opportunity to go deeper with our borrowers to help our members and hopefully create some more yield by pricing for the additional risks that we're taking. So some credit unions have already realized that and they're starting to pivot to take on more risk on the credit side because it's, they, they can, they're going to get more yield in the loan portfolio than they are in the investment portfolio in this environment. And this is impacting margins as well. Again, something you've seen. I mean, we're looking at a 50 basis points cost of funds. I don't have that chart in here, but that's what, that's what uh, Steve Rick and, and Mike Shank are targeting for the next couple of years, about a 50 basis points cost of funds as an industry. So you, so now we look at the margins, you know, the yield on assets that I just showed you coming down. So now what we see is we were at 315 in, in net interest margin last year. We're down to about 290. That's a projection this year. We're looking at about 270 next year because of the, the because of the current rate environment. And you've all seen, you know, those of you that have had uh, loan increases this year has probably come on the mortgage side. You've probably had some, some use, some auto loan increases, but what's happening is ultimately with this refi boom, your balance sheets repricing. So you've got loans at a higher rate repricing at lower rates. You've got investments in maturing at higher rates, renewing at lower rates. So that's starting from a balance sheet perspective. It's impacting those margins. So, so this is going to create a struggle for credit unions over the next couple of years. So I took the, I took the liberty of, of pulling, creating a peer group of all credit unions in Vermont. And what I did was like one peer group was all credit unions in New England. And the second peer group was all credit unions in, North, in the Northeast. Now there's some overlap there because New England, Northeast, were all kind of the same, but, but there were two or three states that are pulled into that peer group. But look what, look what we've done, look at Vermont. And what you've done from a margin perspective over the past few years. I mean, and you're feeling the same pinch that all credit unions are feeling in the Northeast and in New England because of what I just talked about with the margins, the cost of funds, the rate environment. You know, as of, at the end of June, Vermont credit unions on average were about 2.97% net interest margin compared to the, the compared to the, their, their peer group in New England and the Northeast. So, so even though, you know, you're seeing the same declines, but you kind of play that out from the, the screen that I just showed you with uh, Steve's projections on what's going to happen with margins. So you could see, you could ultimately see that if that same scenario plays out in Vermont, that your net interest margin could be closer to two and a quarter percent by, by the end of 2021. If everything continue, if, if Vermont experiences the same sort of trends that we're looking at and planning for throughout the rest of, of the rest of the country. Share growth. 
Uh, again, I talked about this. This is really this is really having a huge impact on a lot of credit unions in Vermont. Up through June, thirty almost thirty three percent share growth as 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 an industry or as a state level at state levels of, of of data that we have compared to New England compared to the Northeast overall. I think the, the story embedded here is from from my perspective is consumers in Vermont have a much, much better relationship and they feel safer and secure with credit unions in the state. Just by looking at that huge uh, share growth in the first half of the year. So the flee to safety with Vermont consumers, they see credit unions at that credit unions as that place to go for safety uh, and security. So I, I think there's a, I mean, that's the story here, but the other half, the other side of that's a double-edged sword. Those same credit unions now who are looked at as a safe, safe haven for consumers now we're, are trying to figure out what do we do with, with, this, with this liquidity so we can generate some yield. I know, um, you know, again, the credit union that I serve on, um, I mean, we've had a ton of money in the Tricor overnight accounts. And we just recently took advantage of Tricor's uh, offer of moving some of that money off over, into the Fed, over, over to the Fed, mm -hmm. trying to move some of that money around and generate a little bit more yield um, with that money that's just sitting there in the overnight account. And I think probably some of you have probably already had those conversations with Tricor around what they're doing. But I mean, those are some of the things creatively, you know, when we went through this in my credit union back after the Great Recession, we had a lot of we had a lot of share growth, flat loan growth. So we were trying to figure out what do we do to generate and squeeze yield out of this in this environment. And we ended up doing a lot of leverage type transactions to pull money out from liquidity, invest it somewhere, do some sort of leverage track transaction to, to generate just a little bit more incremental yield uh, through the portfolio. This was, this was telling to me. Um, when you look at loan growth in the region, 5%, 4%, 12, almost 13% loan growth, credit unions in Vermont. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's big to me because again, it gets to what I said earlier, consumers coming to credit unions, the fleet is fleeing to safety, not only to um, put their money where they know it's safe and secure, but also trusting the credit unions to borrow from them and credit unions opening up their doors, you know, cause typically I used to be a banker and I know when things got tough, banks tend to slow down a little bit and shut the doors and try to restrict as much lending as they can cause they don't want to take on the additional risk. This tells me credit unions aren't doing that. Credit unions are completely opposite of that in Vermont and you're opening up your doors and you're helping members as much as you can and getting money into their pockets. I mean, I know there's PPP loans involved in some of this. There's a lot of, there's mortgage refis involved in this, but this was, this was telling to me that where, you know, Vermont has done a, an outstanding job, comparatively speaking, in generating and getting loans out to consumers in the state. So this is, this is a, a, a huge, recognition to, to credit unions in Vermont, because this is really, this is one of the higher loan growths I've seen along the East Coast as it relates to, to state level uh, averages. Now, I'm gonna pivot to, and you know, we talked about uh, the, the importance of and, and the challenges that we're all gonna experience around net interest margin with the rate environment. So, we're, we're a little bit limited as to our capabilities of generating more yield in this environment over the next two or three years. So now the other part of the equation to hit some of our ROA goals is non-interest income. So these are the average, this is from an industry perspective, what we've seen uh, with the trends over the past few years. And you can see fee income you know, anything that the members paying has dropped over the past few years. And we're looking at about 55 basis points um, in, by the end of next year. Other income has grown and we're looking at about 85 basis points just in the opposite direction because of what we're seeing. And I'll I got a chart I'm gonna show you here in a couple of minutes that kind of plays all this out. 
But this is the trend that we've been seeing now for a while. So, you know, generating not net interest income in this environment and the philosophy that, that maybe you might have and maybe having discussions. I mean, right now, credit unions are, are member friendly when it comes to fees. It's, it's, it's abuse kind of fees that we charge. And maybe some of you might be having some of those tough conversations around what are some other fees that we can charge? How do we maybe not be quite so gratuitous in our fee structure and maybe be a little bit more creative in our fee structures to generate that non-interest income and, and, and rely on other income as well that, that I'll talk about here in a second. Back uh, the beginning of the year, my peer and I were asked to uh, speak at the Discovery Conference and we spoke with another uh, uh, credit union group out west around fee and other income and maximizing the, 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 the uh, income statement. So what we did was with Ann's help and her peer out in the West, we, we polled some credit unions of all side, all asset sizes, probably about, I think it was like 38 or 39 credit unions who responded across the country. And we asked them in the survey to give us, trying to get an understanding of, okay, what is your current fee and other income mix? You know, what's driving fee income? What's driving other income in your credit union? So as of the end of December, and, and I don't know, and, and you can probably compare this to what you're experiencing with your own, with your own mix of, of uh, non-interest income overall, but this, those 38, 39 credit unions we talked to, and again, across the board from an asset band perspective, this is what they were telling us, that about 20, almost 24% of their fee income was coming from NSF and courtesy pay. Now, I don't know if you, if you knew this or saw this, but in August of last year, that trend line for NSF and courtesy pay was already trending down. We were down to about 34% as of last August as a percentage of overall fee income. I know in my credit union, we, were, we had a very lucrative courtesy pay program and we started to see the decline in that revenue month over month back in 2016. So that trend, because so many consumers now are now, are now monitoring their account balances with, 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 their, with their mobile uh, banking, their online banking, they're watching, those, they're watching their balances and making sure that they're making those transfers to avoid any NSF or courtesy pay fees. So, so we already started to see that decline. Debit card interchange, that other income, 26%. Credit card, 15%. Uh, the insurance programs, you can see that, that these areas really have struggled with those credit unions that we polled from a percent. And then, you know, uh, real estate, ATM fees started to, I mean, 7.6%, those surcharges and fees that you're collecting at your ATM machines. So this was at the end of December of last year. And then we asked them, okay, so tell us what happened from January through May of this year. And this is what they told us in the survey. NSF courtesy pay now went from 23, 24% down to 12%. Now, some of that plays out as it relates to, you know, because of the NCUA, um, NCUA letters and NCUA recommendations of through COVID, waiving fees, not assessing penalties, those types of things to, to your credit union, to your members. That's playing out in here as well. But but you can see that trend line continues to go down. Debit card jumped up because of the stay at home order. More and more people are using their debit cards, shopping online, um, ordering food uh, to be delivered, those types of things. So, so that's starting to, you know, that, that's really what we're seeing play out here. Credit card didn't move much at all. And, and for the reason being the credit card interchange, because of what I said before with consumer confidence, people are, because of the usage, people are gonna use the debit card before they use the credit card because they know the debit card, the cash is there. It's in the account. They're not incurring any debt by using that credit card to pay for whatever it is they wanna pay for. So that's kind of why we're seeing that play out a little bit here in the first, you know, the first five months of this year. Real estate almost 17%, that took a big jump. 
because of what we saw with mortgage refis in the first half of the year, people taking advantage of the lower rate. I can remember back in, 20, in 2010, talking to the CFO saying, people really should start refinancing their mortgages because we're probably never gonna see rates this low again. Well, here we are 10 years later, we're, having, we're saying the same thing. We're probably never gonna see rates go this low again. So, so a lot of credit unions generate a lot of origination fee income. Uh, some were selling real estate, selling those loans to the secondary market and retaining the servicing rights. So, so we really saw a big jump in, in, in real estate uh, revenue as it related to fee and other income. This kind of how things have played out from a mixed perspective. So I'm not sure how you know, your numbers line up to this, but these are the trends that we saw up through May of this year. And again, we were just starting to get into the COVID pandemic. I mean, it, we were just on the front end of it. And my guess is we're probably going to see a little bit more deterioration, especially with courtesy pay. Um, but here's the challenge. Debit card, debit card interchange. That's a great source of revenue for us. One of the challenges is going to be moving forward that your member or consumers, how, how much are they going to want to have a plastic card handing it back and forth post COVID? One of those key learnings after we, hopefully when we get through this, this pandemic. So how, how comfortable are consumers going to be taking a card out of their, put it in their hand, giving it to somebody else to put it in their hand. So this is going to create a different environment from a payments perspective, where instead of pulling the card out, you're going to pull the phone out and you're going to pay with a mobile app. So that's going to impact. And we already saw a lot of the merchant groups and, and Joe could probably speak to this because he's probably been in Washington battling and fighting for, for credit unions as it relates to the interchange revenue uh, fight that we've had with the merchants, with the merchant uh, um, lobbyists, the retailers. They don't. They they want to. They want to reduce the usage of the debit and credit card at their point of sale because once that goes through the rails, they're paying for that. So they're trying to. They're trying to get people to rather than use their plastic at that point of sale, they're trying to get them to use their own point of sale, whether it be their their credit card. Some of the big box stores. You know, why don't you sign up for our card? You'll save ten percent on your purchase today. Uh, you won't pay interest for the next six months. Those are the types of things that merchants are trying to do to get people to stop using your cards and use their cards because they not only generate the, the revenue from the card purchase, but they're reducing what they're paying for interchange fees when you use those cards. So those things are gonna to continue to be challenged, I believe, as we kind of walk through the next two or three years. This is how, and I, I wasn't able to get what the mix was for Vermont, uh, because with the call reports, as you all know, this is all call report data. It, you've just got the two buckets. You've got fee income, you got other income. So it was, uh, it was hard to, to, to drill down into what your mix is, is, but use those charts that I showed you before just to compare to how, how you're doing. But from a fee income perspective, 66 basis points um, of, of fee. So, you know, from a fee standpoint, doing a much better job uh, in generating that level of, of revenue. And, and you've been over 60 basis points now for since 2015, where the rest of the, 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 rest, the, rest of the peer group has, has struggled as it relates to generating that fee income as a, as a, as a percent of average assets. So you know, I think it's important here to, to look at you know, what is your mix in fee income? Where, where, what's driving that revenue? Is it NSF and courtesy pay? Is it, you know, in, in this case, uh, you know, how much of it was origination fees from uh, PPP loans uh, or, or mortgage originations? So what is in this number that, that has made Vermont credit unions pretty successful? I mean, think about the trend line I showed you earlier from, a, from a, an industry perspective. That trend line was doing this. Vermont has stayed relatively level and started to and ticked up a little bit in 20 and 2020. So, so there's some magic to what you're doing. So my suggestion would be whatever that mix is, take a look at it because what I tell credit unions is it's nice that you're generating that level of revenue current state, but what's the sustainability moving forward with that revenue stream, whether it's mortgages, because mortgage refis are like this based on what the rate environment is, 
And what's happening with, you know, as I said, NSF and courtesy pay, debit card, I mean, what's ATMs, you know, more, less people are using the AT, are going to start using the ATMs, but can, again, for the same reasons that I mentioned with plastic, if they're not going to hand plastic over the counter after we get, as we move through COVID, are they going to want to pass cash back and forth over the counter? So, so those are some things to think about as, as you think about that fee and other income mix that you have. And this is where we stand with other income in Vermont as it relates to New England credit unions and credit unions in the Northeast. Again, the, 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 the difference here based on what the industry has, has, has done, Vermont's going up with fees while the industry's coming down. On this side, other income, the industry is going up a little bit, Vermont's coming down a little bit. Now that could be just the way you report certain revenue streams on the call report that could be different from what other credit unions are doing. There could be some other, there could be call report issues here that, that are playing out. But other from an other income perspective, interchange, um, real, selling real estate loans and retaining the servicing, QSO investments, um, all you know, ancillary services, payment protection, wealth management, insurance services, all of those things play out in this in this bar graph right here. So so you're right around 71 basis points at the end of June. So that number's coming down a little bit, but again, overall, Vermont has done a pretty good job as relatively speaking, comparatively speaking. So we talked about margins. We talked about the importance of non-interest income and how to supplement that and how, you know, what is the sustainability of that in this current environment as we wait for rates to come back. I mean, I'm sure it probably would be about another year or two before the NCUA starts telling you, well, be careful on your balance sheet because rates are going to start going up. I mean, they told us that for 10 years after the Great Recession, and we really never saw rates go up that much. Uh, you know, so what's going to happen? When are rates going to go up? How do you, how do you generate that additional non-interest income. The other part of the equation is managing operating expenses. You can see that, you know, one of Steve's charts here, you can see how as an industry, operating expenses overall are coming down. Now, I look at this a little bit as kind of a false positive because one of the reasons that operating expense ratios are coming down so rapidly is because asset growth has accelerated and is, is, coming, is growing faster than, than expenses are being managed. Some of you are probably seeing a reduction in operating expenses over the last few months because of COVID. You've shut down some locations, you've got, uh, you're working with, you may have had to furlough some employees, you've got some things going on that helped reduce some of your operating expenses in this time, in this time frame. But the one thing, you know, how, how sustainable is that going to be? So what were some of the key learnings that you have through COVID as you implemented your business continuity plans to get through not only as we walked into COVID, but you know, we're starting to see some of the, you know, it's COVID starting to rear its ugly head again with, with spikes around the country. So managing operating expenses and how, what were the key learnings as it related to operational efficiency that you gleaned from your business continuity uh, plans when you executed on those? Um, technology enhancements, you know, what did you have, you know, what are some things that you had to do current state to retool and get ready and be able to do business in this new environment what were those things that you had to do? And how, what are those things you can use to carry forward from an operational efficiency perspective? Talent management. I remember talking to this group two years ago and part of the conversation was around talent management and the, the difficulty in attracting talent because we were running at full employment and trying to, trying to recruit and retain talented individuals and create succession plans for yourself not only for your at the CEO level and the C-suite level, but throughout the organization. So what we're seeing now is a shift. And I saw Mike's going to talk a little bit after lunch about the, the workforce, the workplace. We're seeing more, and some of you may have people who work remote. It may still be working remotely. 
Well, that's, that's going to be one of those shifts where a lot of credit unions are going to have to think through what jobs can be done remotely and what jobs need to be done in-house. And, and I, I, I always, from in my credit union days, I, I, it was always, we have 50 employees and the only way we can be productive and successful is all 50 of those employees need to be within these four walls from eight to five every day. That's the only way we can be productive. Well, studies are now showing that those people who work remotely are actually more productive working in a remote environment than they are coming into the office every day and working. So how do you leverage that remote, what people are in, in this, I, I, I jotted this down, the State of American Workforce, it was a Gallup poll they did in 2017. And this kind of gets to that retention and recruiting of talent. And it gets to the operating expense because the more it costs you to attract, retain, you got employee turnover, that's adding expense to your, to your personnel line. So, so here's something that, you know, a key learning that, you know, from a, we, we learned some things about consumer behavior, but from a talent management and an employee behavior, and this was in 2017, this was before COVID. Those people that were polled, 35% said they would change jobs if they could work remotely. And out of that 35%, I think it was like 42% were millennials. And then 37% said they would change jobs if they could at least work remotely two or three days a week. Okay, again, that's pre-COVID. So if you're in the situation where you've got people retiring, you've got people leaving the organization and people are gonna start looking at, do I want to have to come into this job five days a week and work 40 hours or 37 and a half hours or 32 hours, whatever that happens to be, do I want to continue to do that and continue to pay for gas and travel and everything that goes with that when I've got a job over here potentially where I only have to go into the office a couple days a week and I can, remote, I can work remotely three days a week. So, so those are some of the things and I put that out there because when we think operationally efficient, the upfront cost of moving people from a face-to-face -face environment to a remote environment. And, and I, I, get, I, I get the fact that it's, it's tough to say we can put all these people remote because we've got member mentalities, member behaviors, consumer behaviors that, that you know, I want to look you in the eye. I want to sit down in front of you face-to-face -to, -face to do business. I get that. But when you think about the operational efficiency and how we manage the operating expense side of the income statement, those are some things to think about. How can we shift workers so we're, we reduce our utility cost we reduce we reduce the the overhead cost of of running those branches what are you know how do we do that so now that we, we've got in the plan that we need to we need to renovate and expand this particular building because we're busting at the seams or we need to build a new operation center or so those are the things to think about when you think about the operating expense moving forward what are things that can be done remotely and leveraged through technology and digital channels versus building and expanding and increasing your depreciation expense and, and, and those, those your tax expense, your utilities expense. So, so those are some of the things to maybe think through as you think about operationally efficient efficiency. How do we work smarter leveraging technology, not only at the member level, but in the back office as well. This is what operation, operating expenses have done in Vermont. I mean, you've, you've come down and again, you're experiencing the same kind of thing that I showed you in the earlier chart. The, the asset growth uh, has, has accelerated expense growth, but at the same time, you know, on average credit unions in Vermont are right about 3.3, almost 3.4% as of June. The rest of the region are just shy of of 3%. Now, granted, that's a little bit diluted because you've got in that sample size, you've got some billion dollar credit unions in that sample size. That's because typically what you see is the operating expense levels at a larger, because of the economies of scale, the operating expense levels on those billion dollar credit unions and higher typically run lower than what they would for a hundred million dollar credit union. 
So, so there's a little, again, a little dilution in that a little bit based on the sample, the, the credit unions that are in the sample size, but really doing a pretty good job from an operating expense perspective overall in Vermont. And this is what the growth has been. I mean, you've been running seven, six, seven percent growth over the past few years. You've got a decline up to the first half of the year. Um, but again, controlling those expenses. One of the things to consider is as you think about that operation, operational efficiency piece, that technology. And, and I know in my own credit union, it was one thing to say, we're going to get more technology on board. We're going to be more tech savvy. We're going to leverage data. That's all fine when you put it on a piece of paper and tell the board, here's what we're doing. But if you don't have the talent in house to manage it and create it day to day, that creates a challenge. So basically what you've done is you spent a whole lot of money with tools that nobody knows how to use effectively. So that kind of gets to that talent management piece. It costs money to bring that mindset into the credit union. It costs money to develop that technology, that infrastructure to bring into the credit union. So credit unions were built on collaboration. I mean, Joe went into a, a little bit of a history lesson with credit unions in Vermont and CUNA Mutual. That's how credit unions were built, collaboration. So leveraging the, the strategy of do you buy, do you build, or do you partner? I mentioned you know, doing a similar presentation at our discovery conference back in August. And we polled, I think uh, that we had probably, I, I don't know what the exact number was, but we polled people moving forward from an operating expense perspective. As you grow, and you enhance the organization, are you looking to implement a buy, a build, or a partner strategy? Well over 50% of those people, those credit unions that we polled said, we're planning to implement a, a partner strategy and we're looking to implement it within the next year, year or two. So that's where that whole collaboration and partnership and typically why, you know, why spend all the money to, to attract that talent and create that infrastructure on your own, when you can partner with somebody who already has that expertise, already has that talent, and they can bring that to the table and help manage it. And that helps bring that operating expense down uh, in the short term and in the long term, quite frankly. The short term is gonna be expensive because you gotta, technology isn't cheap. Um, but in the long term, you're helping to reduce and level off that operating expense moving forward. Delinquency. I mean, this, this is right off one of Steve's, Steve Rick's presentations. What we've seen in the past is as uh, here, here's in the red, here's our recessions. When we see unemployment go up, we see delinquency track with it. And when delinquency tracks with it, charge offs track with it as, as well. So you can see what delinquency has done here since, uh, since we started to see the spike in unemployment, this black line, and we can see what charge-offs have done over the same period of time. So we, we're really anticipating that uh, charge-offs are gonna start to settle down and come start to come back down at the end of 2021 into 2022, depending on what happens with unemployment. That's really the big indicator. This is Vermont. Uh, Vermont, I mean, I was, again, I, I saw that, you know, Vermont was as of September 4.2% unemployment rate. I mean, that, that's great. I mean, you, you spiked, I mean, you, you had a, you spiked back here, 2001, spiked again during the Great Recession, spiked way up here, but here's the good news. This trend line is very, very similar to every other state that I've looked at. And this is from the St. Louis Fed, from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. But this, this trend line is pretty much what every state in the country experienced through COVID. The good news for, for Vermont is you're down to four, again, you're, you're, you're down to less than 5% unemployment, which is, which is great compared to um, US is right around 8% unemployment. New England is right around 9% overall. Um, so I went back to see what the spike was for, for Vermont. In 2001, you peaked at 
unemployment. The Great Recession, you peaked at 6.9% unemployment. COVID, in March, you peaked at 16.5% unemployment. So, so that has come down drastically over the past few months. So you, you know, you're below 5% unemployment as a state. And, and, and I wanted to throw this in here for initial claims. You can see initial claims, and again, you could overlay this chart to pretty much any state in the country, and it, was, it would run the same. So you can see how initial claims spiked up a little bit at the Great Recession. You spiked here, but now you're coming down drastically as it relates to those, those incurred continued claims moving forward. So, so from, from that perspective, if you, if you take that tracking, that map that Steve has tracked out unemployment, charge-offs, you could, you could really make the argument that, well, maybe the delinquency in the charge-off impact to credit unions of Vermont isn't going to be as, as great as it's going to be or as high as it's going to be with other credit unions in other parts of the country. That, that's kind of the good news that I glean from, from these charts. Because this is where you've been from a delinquency perspective over the past few years. I mean, 1%, um, you know, you're down to 60, 60 basis points at the end of June. Now, some of the things that's that are playing out here is we've got those delinquency numbers, but we, but we all know that many credit unions have offered skip pay, skip payments, forbearances, there's a lot of stuff going on in those numbers, which are really might not be in that. So that 60.6% on a delinquency rate could jump once we get through, once, once some of these forbearances and skip payments start to come back where the members have to start making payments again, we could see a spike there. But again, if you go back and think about that unemployment track, the traje trajectory of unemployment and how delinquency follows it, Vermont is on well on the down the downslope of that. So hopefully delinquency is going to follow that where you don't see the huge spikes in delinquency. I mean, this is kind of, you see in the Northeast, this is being influenced by the medallion loans that a lot of the New York credit unions got put out of business uh, with, with some of that. That's really influencing some of these higher delinquency numbers. But overall, um, I think Vermont has done a pretty good job in managing delinquency overall. And this is the growth. So this tells me this 35% decline. I'm, I'm only speculating, this is something you'd have to validate in your own credit unions, but I'm speculating that some of that drop is because of what you've done in helping members get through COVID, extending payments, offering forbearances, uh, those types of things. Uh, so that, that's that's something I'm I'm guessing has played out here because we're not and we're seeing a little bit of it in New England overall, but it's actually on the upper end. It's not huge, six and a half percent, but that's what I think is playing out in Vermont and, and in New England is just the the credit unions appetite and reaching out and helping members with those with those payments and making sure they could get through the situation that they're in because of COVID. But the other thing too to think about is and one thing that I always watch is the 30 to 59 day bucket. Okay, what's what's in that 30 to 59 day bucket today? What was in that bucket in January? What was in it in March? What was in it in June? Monitoring that that trend line because as you know, there could be some trouble waiting in that th in that in that uh, 30 to 59 day category that could easily move to 60 days and and now you now you start to see that growth in delinquency again and that's the one thing i'm kind of concerned about as it relates to delinquency overall is how much how much of those how many of those members that are in that 30 to 59 day bucket or 15 to 29 day how many of those members were actually struggling pre-covid and once we get through this, where they start to get back, where, where we start to get back to hopefully some sense of, of normal, how many of those members are actually gonna say, I can start making my payments again, and how many are gonna say, I can't do it, here are the keys to the car, here are the keys to the house. Those are the things that concern me. And that's something we experienced at my credit union coming through the Great Recession, was we started to see, when we thought things were starting to come back to life, we started to see members coming in with, 
the keys to the house and hey, I, I'm gonna sign the house over to you, I can't afford it anymore, or we wanna do a short sale. Those are, so that, those are the things that kind of concern me coming through COVID um, that, I, that I hope a lot of credit unions don't experience, but that's the one thing that I really, I really want credit, and I'm not saying that you're not doing that, but if it's something that your collections department isn't monitoring, it might be one of those things to, to consider. Charge off ratios, pretty much well within uh, the uh, the rest of the country. You can see this is you know this is the the, the northeast, and again this is this is those those nasty medallion loans, those credit unions that originated them, and those credit unions that purchased them. Um, that's what played out here from a from a, a charge off perspective. Uh, but pretty much you know you've done a pretty good job keeping charge off. So you're, you're managing to a, a, a delinquency ratio. That's that's member friendly. That you're helping the member. You're not charging off immediately. You're keeping the charge off ratios down. So I mean, I think you're really doing a great job in Vermont in, in managing and working with members and helping them through situations, which leads to the provision expense, um, net interest margin, fee and other income, expenses, and now we add on the provision for loan loss. And, and how that plays out. You can see we're, these, these projections have come down. I know Steve at one point had 2021 up over 100 basis points of average assets. So that has come down because of the, a little bit more, a little bit more of a comfort level with what ha was what's happening with unemployment in this case, which to Vermont's uh, case where unemployment is really starting to, to come down even at a faster pace than other states and other regions, hopefully you don't see this level. But again, this gets to that added expense that's impacting your return on assets when you think about the, the provision expense. That's national. And here's where, here's where uh, Vermont has been. I mean, Vermont really has been, you know, I, I believe the industry at one point last year, it was, oh yeah, the last chart, 0.43%. You've been well below that for for quite a while now. So, so uh, you know, kudos to you know managing the entire delinquency process to make sure that again servicing members. The one thing I would say is, as you think about calculation for your your loan loss reserve, if you haven't done it, maybe the one thing you could you you could consider is is go back to your historical data. In the percentages that you used from 2008 through 2010, 2011, just to compare notes as to from those external the variables that you're bringing into the calculation, the percentages that you're using in those loan categories. If you haven't done it, go back to the Great Recession and take a look at to see to see what were those percentages back then, and how do they measure up and compare to what you're using today with your current calculations. So just, just something to think about as you're, as you're doing that. And this all gets down to the net income. Margins will be squeezed. This gets to the importance of non-interest income because of the margins being squeezed. Operating expense management, managing delinquency and getting to, you know, managing to that, that provision for loan loss. I didn't say with the delinquency, but things around what, are, what, are the, what is the collection department doing currently to be proactive? You've got, a, you've got the borrower who has never been past due and now all of a sudden they're showing up on the 15 day delinquency list. Are you reaching out to those members to say, what's happening? Are you okay? Is there anything we can do to help? And I'm not telling you anything you probably don't already know, but those are some of the things that I've heard a lot of credit unions doing, getting proactive and not assuming that that A borrower is gonna be okay and they're gonna make a payment getting out in front of it and trying to help that borrower. So everything, anything a member, anything a credit union can do in, in this environment to help keep members in their loans is, is going to be, is going to, is going to be uh, rewarded in the long term as it relates to that whole impact on provision expense and what we just talked about. So you can see 93 basis points of ROA last year. We're projecting that's going to drop to 50 next or this year and down to 35 next year because of that continued compression. Now, when you back out, and this is a chart many of you have either seen before from Steve or, or even Mike Shank may have shared this before. Last year, 
when we think about overall return on assets, everything that's going into that net income was 93 basis points. You pull out the, the fee and other income and just rely on your margins. This is what happened as an industry, negative 47 basis points. So again, especially in this environment, the importance of fee and other income. So in Vermont, at the end of June, you were at 56 basis points of ROA. You've been running the last two years, a little over 80 basis points, which is great, which is, which is ahead of your, the peer credit unions across the, across the region, whether it be in New England or in the Northeast. So you've done a great job there, 56 basis points. But when we pull out your fee and other income, you're down to a negative 80 basis points. So again, it goes back to that importance of your fee and other income mix. Where's that, where's that revenue stream coming from? How sustainable is it? Now, this has been a trend for many, many years now, but it's one of those trends that credit unions have tried to adapt and pivot and adopt different, different philosophies and try to generate different avenues of, of revenue. From my own perspective, I think in this environment, it's even more important to do that. Now, granted, credit unions have done an outstanding job over the past, since the Great Recession, growing net worth, growing capital, because your net worth is for rainy days, and we're, we're in a rainy day right now. So many credit unions have had enough net worth to, to sustain themselves and get through, from a short-term perspective, get through what we're going through right now. But those credit unions that want to get locked in and start to grow and maintain a certain level of net worth through that growth based on board expectations, this is where this all comes in, in this environment, generating, you know, generating yield, generating non-interest income, balancing that operating expense increase to make sure that that ROA is adequate enough to sustain and continue to rebuild net worth in, in the future for your members. So, just some general thoughts and ideas that I put out here. Some of them I've already talked about, but control deposit growth to help control your margins, help improve your margins. If you have a wealth management program, I know this is difficult to hear sometimes that you would push money off your balance sheet over to a wealth management program. But if you have a wealth management program, now's the time to push and leverage that program to take that member who wants to get more yield. Now I know there's, there's risk aversion built in to some members and I, and I understand that, but if you can get a member to move from off your balance sheet in this environment, go over to the wealth management program, you've lost the deposit, which is fine. And based on what we're looking at right now for deposit growth and liquidity issues, but you've retained the relationship and you're driving some non-interest income, based on what you're making off that wealth management program. That beats that person taking that money and going down the street or going out to Edward Jones or one of the other investment houses that might be on Main Street uh, that, that they're gonna do business with that they go to Rotary with every, every week. So leverage the wealth management program, create your own loan demand. I mean, I don't think that's an issue right now for Vermont based on double digit loan growth the first half of the year. But what are some things you can do to generate additional loan growth, debt consolidations, those types of things, creating, you know, member business loan assistance. I mean, we've got the PPP program going on, but there are other things maybe that we can do. Um, incent your lenders. If you have an online loan process and you've got loan applications being dropped in the process, and I know we used to run into this all the time, there'd be a ton of applications that get started in our online queue that never would come through to being closed and booked. So we started doing some, some research on that to figure out, okay, why are those loans being dropped? And that's something if you've got lenders or you've got people working in a remote environment that are, that are within your firewalls and are within your secure systems, leverage those people to make phone calls to those, those borrowers. Hey, I see you had an application going, you didn't complete it. Anything we can do to help to move the process forward. So those types of things to create your own demand. I, I mentioned the, the early warning signs on the collection side. You know, are you tracking the reasons for your delinquency in this environment? Is it unemployment? Is it disability? You know, what is, what is driving your delinquency levels in this environment? 
because that's going to help from a historical perspective down the road. Um, separating loan modifications, making sure you've got your bucket of loan modifications because of COVID and your trouble debt restructures. I mean, because if you overlap those two, I think it gets a little bit convoluted sometimes. So if you're not doing that, consider doing that, keeping those two buckets separate. And I know that for, from our credit union, the, the board I'm on, NCUA has already asked, are you doing those things? How are you tracking delinquency and how are you tracking loan modifications from your TDRs? Uh, so, so that's something else to, to keep in mind. And then creating loan yield. Increase, you take on a little bit more credit risk, help the member, price for that risk that you're taking, and then how do you mitigate for that credit risk? And one of the things is leverage payment protection to leverage that and mitigate that credit risk against involuntary unemployment or disability or life, you know, passing, you know, passing away, those types of things. So as you look at these things, you think about your strategic plans, a lot of credit unions are thinking more around, we got a strategic plan we're thinking about, but now we got to start thinking more about scenario planning. And, and whatever we put out as a strategic objective, we need to take a step back and ask the question, what's the threat to our meeting those strategic objectives? And, and COVID has been a key lesson as to why a lot of credit unions are doing that now from a planning perspective. So I've done a lot of talking. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions out there uh, through the chat or, or otherwise. Christine, we know you're talking, but your mic is off. <laughs> so you can try sign language, but I, I, I can't read sign language anyway. <laughs> Neither can I. Um, okay, well, I'll sub for Christine temporarily <laughs> here. Um, thank you so much, Jeff, for all of your discussion this morning. Um, it's enlightening and uh, and very I hope very helpful to uh, everybody that's listening today and that watches this video when we archive it. Um, and if people have questions or comments, I'm sure they can connect with you directly. After uh, that. yeah, my my contact information I put right here. I mean, you all either work with Mark or Jeff there, and the, right. uh, they know how to reach me. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm all. I'm always open to meeting with anybody, talking to anybody. I'd be happy to help out in any way that I can. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jeff.